those amounts that are normally paid out of the profits of the company or retained profits of the company to the shareholders of the company is what we call dividends. So this simply means that, for example, if you acquired shares in a particular company, at the end of the financial year, uh, you'll be able to get what we call dividends out of the profits of the company. So what you should actually be able to know about dividends at this particular point is that dividends of the company will be paid out of what we call the distributable profits of the company. So dividends can only be paid. So dividends will be paid out of the distributable profits of the company. So what we mean by the distributable profits of the company is that profits must be realized, profits must be realized at the end of the financial year so that the company can be able to pay part of those profits as dividends to the members of, of the company or to the shareholders of the company. So in this case, we are seeing that uh, you can't pay dividends from anywhere else apart from the distributable profits or profits realized within a particular financial year. So this simply means that, for example, if a company has made a loss, so they won't actually pay dividends in that particular year. So they won't pay dividends in that particular year. So if you are shareholder in such a case, basically, if there are no profits, the company made a loss, you'll basically come out empty handed as the shareholder of, of the company. So dividends can only be paid out of the distributable profits of the company. You can't pay it out of the share capital of the company because we say that if you pay it out of the share capital of the company, then basically you won't actually be maintaining the share cap capital of the company. So uh, you can't pay dividends out of the share capital, even if the company has not realized profits. So there's no way basically you can be able to pay dividends out of the share capital of the company. So it can only be paid out of the distributable profits of the company. So what will happen in a company is that dividends in a particular financial year will be proposed. So dividends will actually be proposed will actually be proposed by the directors of the company. So they just propose, because they're the ones mandated to prepare the financial statements of the company, directors are the ones who are supposed to ensure the books of accounts of the company are actually properly uh, maintained. So in such a case, once they realize that in a particular financial year, the company has realized profits, they'll be able to propose as to how much the company can be able to pay as dividends. The company can be able to pay as dividends. So in such a case, it simply means that they propose a particular figure that will actually be approved by the members at the AGM. So this is basically the meeting that basically will actually approve dividends of the company before it is actually paid out to the members or the shareholders of the company. So when you hear a company is actually holding an AGM or an annual general meeting, one of the purpose or basically one of the agendas is usually to approve the proposed dividends of the company to be paid to the members or the shareholders of, of the company, to be paid to the members or the shareholders of the company. So uh, dividends will be proposed by the directors. It will basically be approved by the members at the AGM. So one of the agendas at the AGM we'll see later on under company meetings is to actually approve the proposed dividends of, of the company, approval of the proposed dividends of the company, approval of the proposed dividends of the company. So what will happen after it has been approved at the AGM? So the company will send out the dividend vouchers and dividend mandates. So you have two key documents. So you have the dividend vouchers, dividend vouchers, and the dividend mandates, dividends, mandates. So what do you mean by a dividend voucher? It is simply a document that will clearly indicate as to how much you've gotten as dividends from the company. So part of the contents of what you're calling a dividend voucher, it is simply a document that is sent to a shareholder. It will have the name of the shareholder. It will indicate the number, the, the, class, of, the class of shares on which the dividend is actually being paid. It will indicate the amount of dividends that is being going to be paid to this particular member of the company. It will actually also indicate the name of the company there. It will have the company seal, and basically it might be signed by the company secretary or one of the members of the board of directors. So it is simply a document that is sent out after the dividends has been approved, clearly indicating as to who is getting these dividends. And of course, how much is this particular person getting as dividends from the company? So the company will send out what we call dividend vouchers to the members of the company, which will detail all the details to do with the dividends that is being going, going to be paid by the company. 
the dividends mandates so this one's basically sometimes the company might question or basically ask the members or shareholders to provide the means through which they want the dividends to be channeled to them either you want through mpesa transfer to your account so basically you'll we'll clearly indicate on the dividend mandates which will basically ask a member of a company to indicate as to how he wants the dividends to be paid to him as a member of the company so you'll clearly indicate on the dividends mandates as what is the means through which the dividends will actually be uh, be paid so either mpesa you can choose mpesa so you'll basically indicate as to how you want the dividends to be uh, to be paid so these are key two key two documents that will basically be utilized or used during that particular point of having to pay the the dividends so you're saying dividends will be proposed by the directors it will be, be be approved at the annual general meeting of the company by the members so once they have actually been able to approve uh, then the company will go ahead and actually send out dividend vouchers and dividend mandates to the members of of the company to the members of the company so that is basically uh, what we mean by dividends having to be paid by by the company dividends having to be paid by uh, by the company so uh, sometimes the company can decide to basically not utilize all its profits in terms of paying dividends but they do what we call capitalization capitalization of profits capitalization of profits so they, they do what we call capitalization of profits so what we mean by capital capitalization of profits in this case uh the company will capitalize it will basically put aside uh these particular profits as basically a share capital it can do it in this way instead of having to pay dividends instead of having to pay dividends instead of having to pay dividends uh, they can give out what we call bonus shares by bonus shares it simply means that for example they give the members the option of either taking up the dividends or capitalizing that particular dividends by getting extra shares in the company so if they do such you can be able to realize that they'll be able to sell more shares of the company and therefore capitalize the profits so in this case they can be able to give out bonus shares to the members so in this case what we mean by bonus shares for example if you are to get 100000 as dividends you basically choose the option of having to get shares worth shares worth the 100000 dividends so the dividends won't be paid to you in cash but basically you'll get extra shares you'll get more shares in the company worth or actually equivalent to your dividends if they do such they'll be able to capitalize change the profits into actually becoming capital of the company they will change the profits into becoming the capital of the company by capitalizing the profits how do they capitalize they ask you as a member instead of taking up dividends you can get extra shares in the company so they basically just transfer the dividends and of course basically capitalize it or basically transfer it to the share capital because in this case you would have got extra shares in the company and therefore contributed to the share capital of the company so the company sometimes might opt not to pay the dividends but of course basically capitalize the the profits so that's what we mean by capitalization of profits capitalization of of profits so that is basically what you need to be able to understand with regard to uh, dividends in a company dividends in a company so i want us to start on the next topic i want us to start on the next topic which is debt capital which is debt capital so we can start on debt capital so debt So what do we mean by debt capital so you'll be able to understand the meaning of debt capital meaning of debt capital meaning of debt capital i will be able to understand something about the benches the benches and the types of the benches and the types the benches and the types We'll be able to understand something about distinction between the benches, distinction between the benches and shares, the benches and shares, 
uh, we'll be able to understand something about um, so distinction between debentures and shares. We will also look at similarities, similarities between debentures and shares, similarities between debentures and shares. Uh, we'll also look at uh, charges, charges, charges. In this case, we'll concentrate on two main charges known as a floating charge, a floating charge and a fixed charge, a floating charge and a fixed charge, a floating charge and a fixed charge. Then we'll also look at, then we'll actually also look at, so, uh, we'll be able to look at crystallization of charges, crystallization of charges, crystallization of charges. Uh, then we'll be able to look at um, um, registration of charges, registration of charges, registration of charges, registration of charges. Uh, then we'll be able to look at priority priority of charges, priority of charges. So this is what we are going to be able to cover under this particular topic. So what do we mean by debt capital? So as we, we, we've basically seen that uh, share capital is actually one of the forms of capital of a company or how the company can be able to raise capital. So under shares, we are basically seeing that the company is actually able to sell shares. So the company is actually able to sell shares under share capital. So that is what is happening under share capital, what we've just covered, whereby we, we learned about our prospectors, what actually happens uh, with our prospectors, then eventually a person buys the shares of the company, then he contributes to the share capital of the company. So this is actually another means of how the company as a form of business can actually be able to raise its capital, can actually be able to raise its capital. So in this case, the company is not actually going for the option of having to sell shares. The company is actually going for the option of actually borrowing. So in this case, the company is going to borrow to be able to raise its capital. The company is actually going to borrow to be able to raise its capital. So it's basically a, a form of capital uh, whereby the company is actually raising capital through what we call borrowing from uh, outside, borrowing from outside. So if the company is to borrow, so these are key points to be able to put on your mind. If the company is to borrow, the borrowing of the company can only basically be authorized under the articles of association. So remember we said in the articles of association, basically we'll find what we call the rules governing the internal affairs of the company. So part of the contents of an articles of association is what we call the borrowing powers of the company. So in this case, you are saying this capital is raised through borrowing. The borrowing powers of the company will be contained in the rules governing the internal affairs of the company known as the articles of association. So the borrowing powers of the company will actually basically be found in what we call the articles of association of the company. So in that case, if the company is raising capital through debt capital, we are saying the company is going to borrow. It will be able to borrow only up to the extent as provided for under the articles of association under the articles of association if the company borrows beyond what is actually uh, contained what is actually contained in the articles of association we say such kind of a borrowing is ultra virus borrowing is ultra virus borrowing what we mean by ultra virus it is basically outside the requirements of the articles anything that is actually ultra virus it is basically not within the scope of the rules governing the internal affairs of the company. It is not within the scope of the articles or the memorandum of association. If it is ultra bias, it is not provided for under the articles of association. Anything that basically is not actually basically provided for under the articles, it will be termed as being ultra bias. So we are saying if the company borrows beyond what are the requirements or what is the, what uh, beyond the set limit under the articles, such kind of a borrowing will be termed as being ultra virus borrowing. So what have we said? We've said key points here. We've said key points here. We've said the borrowing powers of the company will be contained in the articles of association of the company. Point number two to go home. 
that if the company borrows beyond these powers, such kind of a borrowing is called ultravirus borrowing. It is called ultravirus borrowing. That is point number two to go home. Point number three, if the company borrows beyond what is actually set in the articles, the company cannot actually be held responsible or liable for such kind of a borrowing. What we mean by this, company itaruka kulipa your pesa. If the company borrows beyond what is actually contained in the articles of association, if it is actually set at 2 billion and it borrows 3 billion, this is actually beyond the set limits under the articles of association. Such kind of a borrowing was ultra. It was ultra. It was beyond the given powers in the articles. In such a case, the company cannot be held liable. So any ultravirus borrowing by the company, the company will never be held liable. Kampuni haita dayo yo pesa, itaruka, even if it is actually taken to the court. In this case, the company basically will basically argue that such kind of a borrowing was actually beyond the powers given in the articles of association. The reason is, I think there's a particular point we learned about the doctrine of constructive notice. I don't know if you can be able to remember that particular place we learned about the doctrine of constructive notice. We say that under the doctrine of constructive notice, that once you form a company or register a company, you are required to deposit part of the requirements. You are required to deposit the articles and the memorandum with the register of companies. So therefore, that particular doctrine clearly states that any third party dealing with the company is actually presumed to have read these particular documents and therefore understands what is actually contained in them. It basically understands what is actually contained in these particular documents. And therefore, if you are dealing with a company in terms of lending money or basically the company borrowing, it is basically presumed that you've read the articles and you clearly know to what extent the company can actually be able to, to borrow. Therefore, if you go ahead and actually lend money that is beyond the set articles, rules set in the articles of association, and that particular borrowing is ultraviolet, you can't hold the company liable as a lender because you could have easily learned that the company cannot be able to borrow such kind of an amount. So you're supposed to basically protect yourself by ensuring that the company is borrowing within the set limits. So in therefore, in this case, any lender who has lent money ultraviolet to the company, he cannot actually basically hold the company liable. Because clearly in this case, as per the doctrine of constructive notice, it is presumed basically you could have easily uh, learned that or known that the company cannot actually be able to borrow this kind of an amount because it is not actually allowed for under the articles of association. So that is point number three to go home. If the company basically borrows money ultraviolet, a third party or a lender cannot hold the company liable. We've already given the reason. The reason is as per provided for under the doctrine of constructive notice, it is presumed any third party dealing with the company, and then he must have read the articles and clearly understood that the company can borrow up to this particular set limit. So, iyo ku lend pesa, iyo ni shauri yako, mbona ulipeana iyo pesa, yet it is not actually allowed under the constitution of the company. It is not actually allowed under sheria ya kampuni. Iyezi borrow pesa ipita yo kiasi, mbona ulipeana, iyo ni shauri yako. You can't hold the company liable. That is point number three to, to go home. Point number four. In such a case, you can see this particular third party is going actually basically to suffer as to how he's going to recover the money from the company. Because you are saying that he lent money ultraviolet to the company and therefore the company cannot be, hold, be held liable. So in such a case, how can this particular party actually uh, serve him or herself to be able to get the money from the company? So there are a few ways of how any lender of money ultraviolet to the company can be able to recover his or her money from the company. In case it is, it is discovered, it was actually ultraviolet lending of money because now in this case, in this case, you can't hold the company lab. You can't take the company to the court and claim for your money. So how basically can you recover your money? For example, if you lent money to the company, ultra buyers. Number one, what you can actually be able to do, number one, it is very important. Number one, how you can be able to recover this particular money. If you check your notes, is there. So that's why I don't want to do a lot of writing here. Number one, this is how you'll be able to recover your money from the company. Number one, this is how you'll do it. What you'll do, you'll seek to rank as one of the creditors of the company. But in this case, you won't actually basically be given priority. You won't actually be prioritized. So basically, they might actually basically probably pay those ones who are actually secured first. Those ones basically who have charged 
the assets of the company first. So you want to get actually any priority. Utakuwa tu kwa queue ukingoja until when they reach up to you is when you can get the money from the company. So number one option of how you recover the money if you've lent money and to the company, seek to rank as a creditor of the company. Although you might not be given priority in the payment or being paid the due amount from the company. So that's what you can be able to do. Number one, seek to rank as one of the creditors of the company, although you won't be given priority in terms of being paid money from the company. Number two option, what you can actually be able to do if you discover that this particular company has not actually spent this particular money. So the money is basically still maybe in the accounts or bank accounts. So you can actually basically seek for a court injunction. What do you mean by a court injunction? It's simply an order to do what we call stop the company from spending the money. So your PESA, you can freeze it, get a court order to freeze it. So the company doesn't actually spend the money. So the question will actually arise that how will you know that the money is still in the bank? Probably you could be maybe a bank that had lent the money. And that money is actually basically in one of the accounts in you as a bank, you as a bank provider of that particular service, you can easily tell the money that is actually in an account of your client. So you clearly know that this particular money is still there. It hasn't been wired to any other account. You can basically seek for a court injunction uh, to be able to ensure that this particular money is not actually spent in any way by the company after you discover that such kind of a lending of money was actually ultra, ultra buyers. So that is option number two. Option number three, what you can actually be able to do is basically to seek for a tracing order from the court. And if this money had already been spent to basically maybe acquire assets in the company, seek for what we call a tracing order from the court and recover the assets from the company such that you can actually be able to secure those particular assets and maybe you sell them off and maybe recover your money from the company. So seek for a tracing order. As so you said, in the court, you go for two kinds of orders. So number two, the one we, we, we've just seen, you can seek for an injunction order to stop the company from spending the money. Another order you can actually be able to seek from the court is what we call a tracing order from the court to basically trace the assets that have basically been bought by those, those particular amounts of money that you had lent to the company. And of course, secure those particular assets. And of course, secure those particular assets. So Bob is saying, I repeat number two. Number two, you're saying this seek for a court injunction to stop the company from spending the money in case the money basically is still in the bank accounts or basically the, the money is actually still being held by, by the company. So seek for a court injunction to stop the company from spending the money. Number three, we are saying seek for a tracing order from the court to recover the assets acquired by the money lent to the company, to recover the assets uh, acquired by the money lent to the company. Number four, what you can actually be able to do because this borrowing basically simply means it has been approved uh, by the directors of the company. It, it has been approved by the directors of the company. So therefore, in this case, you can go for those particular directors. Wakubwa, mabazu wa kampuni ndo wali approve your borrowing. So basically, they approved an ultravirus borrowing. Our mabazu wali approve ultravirus borrowing. So that borrowing that they actually approved to borrow from the bank was actually beyond the set powers under the articles. So they acted ultravirus, these particular directors. So therefore, in this case, you can hold them responsible and not the company. Remember the directors and of course the company are two different parties or persons. So therefore in this case, if you are saying under ultravirus borrowing, the company cannot be held responsible. It simply means that there was someone in the company who basically went ahead and actually basically authorized for the ultravirus borrowing. Now you can hold that particular person or party responsible because he acted beyond the powers set in the articles. And who are these parties probably? They are the top guys. They are the directors of the company. So therefore, in this case, number four, what you can be able to do is to hold the directors of the company responsible to be able to pay the amount lent ultravirus to the company. Probably if you can be able to realize or basically provide evidence that they are the ones who basically approved the borrowing by the company. So that's how basically a lender who has lent money ultravirus to the company can actually be able to recover his or her money from the company, his or her money from the company. So that one has actually been tested. It's not an area to basically forget uh, uh, just like that. Ultravirus borrowing. Ultravirus borrowing. What is ultravirus borrowing? If the company borrows beyond the set 
rules and regulations under the articles. So what, what are you supposed to know about ultravirus boring? The company will never be held responsible for ultravirus boring. So the company will never be held responsible for ultravirus boring. So we are saying you as a third party lender, basically you'll have a hard time to be able to recover your money. And of course, I've clearly explained as to why you can't hold the company liable. It is because of the doctrine of constructive notice. What does the doctrine of constructive notice state? It states that once you register a company or a company is actually registered, the articles and the memorandum become public documents, easily accessible by any person by simply paying a fee at the registrar's office. So you can easily pay a fee at the registrar's office and basically access the articles of a particular company. So therefore, in this case, it simply means that while you are lending the money as a third party, you could have easily basically known that such kind of a borrowing is actually ultravirus or beyond the set powers. So therefore, you should actually know in advance, you will never hold the company responsible if it actually defaults or basically refuses to pay the, to pay the amount. So how do you protect yourself as a third party or basically a person who has lent money to the company? So we've said in this case, uh, number one, what you can actually be able to do, someone had just asked to repeat number one. So number one, you've said seek to rank as one of the creditors of the company, even though basically you won't be given any priority in terms of being paid before the other persons. So you basically seek to rank as one of the creditors or basically seek to be listed as one of the creditors, even though the company basically will decide at what particular point they'll be able to pay you your, the amount uh, to you as a lender to the company, as a lender to the company, as a lender to the company. So that is what you're supposed to know. So I want us to look at the benches, the benches, the benches. So we've said uh, here under debt capital, the company is actually borrowing to raise its capital. So how does it raise money? How does it raise this particular money by borrowing? So it will be able to use a particular, if someone has a question. Or someone is actually unmute, I think it's who. So uh, I don't think there's a question, it's okay. So uh, we can look at the benches. So the, we are saying the company is boring. So they'll be able to use, remember under share capital. Remember under share capital. Remember under share capital, the company is actually selling shares. Kenneth should mute. The company is actually, ensure you actually mute yourself. Don't unmute yourself because uh, it will cause a lot of disturbances to the others. So just ensure when you log into the class, just mute yourself. Sometimes there's usually noise in the background. So remember you are maybe probably at home. So there's a lot happening at home. People are in the kitchen. So others are moving, so here and there. So others are taking supper. So others have small children or babies. So they want maybe to move around, so make a lot of noise. So it is important when you just log into the class, just mute your background. So probably maybe if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. So there's usually sometimes noise in your background. Or probably maybe you are actually on the move. So you are basically traveling so, and you want to catch up with the class. So basically probably there's a lot of noise where you are you are on earphones. So we'll all be hearing that noise, basically, if you haven't uh, muted uh, yourself. So just make sure you actually mute your, uh, yourself. So the benches, in this case, we are seeing, as I was saying, under shares, we are seeing the company is selling shares. It is selling shares, and of course, people acquire shares, and of course, they become shareholders of, of the company. Under debt capital, the company is actually able to borrow by selling an instrument known as the benches. So, and remember, when we learned about the prospectus, we said that uh, by a prospectus, we simply mean it is simply a notice or an advertisement by the company for basically members of the public to be able to buy either the shares or the debentures of the company. So what do we mean by a debenture? So a debenture simply, it is an instrument or basically a document clearly indicating or authenticating that a particular person or a particular party has actually been able to lend money to the company. And of course, his expectation is actually to get any person who will basically lend to you money, is expecting the principal amount and is actually expecting the interest. So in this case, you are saying it is simply a document authenticating or indicating that a person or a particular party 
has lent money to the company and therefore his expectation is to get the principal amount and of course the interest due on that particular principal amount. So probably a person will never give you money for free. You'll never borrow money for free. You'll go to the bank and borrow money and they'll expect you to pay interest. So you can actually be able to do so as a company by selling what we call debentures. So you sell out debentures, people give you money. And of course, once they give you that particular money becomes the principal amount. And of course they expect you to get actually to pay what we call interest. So you can be able to see something that you must realize here very quickly. Under share capital, you sell shares. What is the expectation of the shareholders? They get dividends. What is the expectation in this case of those who acquire debentures? They get interest. And of course, principal amount at the end of that particular period under which they have lent, lent the money. So that's what we mean by a debenture. So just a document authenticating or indicating a particular party or a person has lent money to the company with the expectation of getting the principal amount and of course the interest due on that particular principal amount. So that's what we mean by, by a debenture. So what are the types of debentures? So we have several types of debentures. So number one, we can have secured debenture. Number two, we can have unsecured debenture. Number three, we can have debenture. We can have convertible debenture convertible debenture. Number six, we can have what we call, um, you said, redeemable, convertible, redeemable, registerable debenture, registerable debentures. These are the types of debentures uh, that, that we can have. So basically, you can look at each one of them so that you can be able to understand them. So you've said secured and secured, redeemable, irredeemable, convertible, convertible, and registerable debentures, convertible and registerable debentures. So what is a secured debenture? What is a secured debenture? What is a secured debenture? So a secured debenture is one under which <clears throat> the assets of the company have been charged or have been used as a security under such kind of lending of money or borrowing. So this simply means that the company is selling the debentures so once it sells the debentures, that person who has lent money to the company, <clears throat> he wants some form of security. So therefore that debenture becomes secured. For example, in this case, they could probably charge or use the motor vehicles of the company as a security. So it simply means that if the company defaults on the payment of the principal amount and interest, that lender can be able to come into the company and take over those particular securities. So it is a kind of debenture or basically a type of debenture under which the assets of the company has been used as the assets of the company have been used as a security have been used as a security to basically secure that particular debenture so unsecured is the opposite of secure. there is no asset that has been charged or used as a security in the company to basically cover for that particular debenture so that is unsecured debenture there is no any form of security so basically, you just know that any person who lends you money, most probably they'll ask for security, that I want some form of security before I give you the, the money. So maybe they could ask you to bring a title deed, it is charged, or they could ask you to bring a logbook, it is charged, or they could ask you to bring a share certificate, or basically your shares, they'll be charged. So in that case, it simply means that any person lending money, the same case with the debentures, so the debenture holders or the ones who have acquired debentures, basically they'll expect uh, that they have some form of security. In case you default as a company to pay, they can come for that security and basically recover their money from you as a borrower. So another thing to be able to note is that if say under shares, you say you become a shareholder here. If you acquire debentures, you become what we call a debenture holder. So you become a debenture holder once you acquire the debenture, we learned about uh, redeemable preference shares. So now in this case, what happens with the debentures is that this particular debenture can be redeemed. It can be redeemed after a particular period of time. Let's say, for example, two or three years. And what we mean by it being redeemed, being redeemed at the date of redemption, the principal amount and the whole, of, the whole interest uh, become payable. Let's say, for example, if it is supposed to be redeemed after three years, at the end of the third year, it simply means that company in a five coin may share with your mutual principal amount yake, 
na imelipa interest due for the last three years completely. So it has been redeemed. So that particular debenture holder is no longer a debenture holder in the company. He has been given all the money he lent to the company, the principal amount, plus the interest at the end of the third year. So that is what we are saying, if the, ben the debenture is said to be redeem redeemable within three years, or basically after the end of the third year. If it's redeemable after two years, at the end of the second year, it simply means that principal amount and the interest fall due at the end of the second year. So by us talking about a redeemable debenture, it is a debenture that can be redeemed after a particular period of time or set period of time under which at the end of this particular period, the principal amount and the interest fall due. So they fall due. It is a must the company pays this particular amounts at the end of that particular period. Irredeemable. So this one is now the opposite of redeemable. This one you can't redeem. They'll basically be uh, like debentures or remain as debentures or debenture holders in the company unless maybe the company is actually liquidated. So what happens in this case for the holder of this particular kind of debenture, he will enjoy interest for the lifetime of the company, for the lifetime of the company. So until maybe when the company is liquidated, that's when now the principal amount becomes due. So you can't redeem it. There is no set period unless the life of the company comes to an end is when basically now you can claim for the principal amount as the lender of the money to the company. You can't redeem it. It is irredeemable. It basically exists for the lifetime of the company. The holder enjoys interest for the lifetime of the company. If the company is liquidated or the life of the company comes to an end, that's when the principal amount falls due. So that's what we mean by irredeemable. You can't redeem. Remember for redeemable, we said, there is a set period. Basically, when you are buying these debentures, you know at the end of the fourth year, according to the agreement, at the end of the fourth year, the principal amount of the amount I've lent will fall due and all the interest will actually fall due. So that is for redeemable debentures. Convertible, convertible, just from the word convert. These ones, you can be able to convert them. You can convert them from being debentures and they become shares in the company. So in this case, what you mean by this, instead of you basically being a debenture holder, you basically convert your interest in the company and become a shareholder. So now this simply means that you won't be getting interest. Basically, now you'll be getting dividends at the end of the financial year. So for a convertible debenture, it is a debenture that can be converted into another interest in the company. We've given the most basically uh, basic example you can be able to understand, converting debentures in the company. Instead of you being a debenture holder, you become a shareholder. And therefore, in this case, your expectation, in this case, basically it won't be interest. You'll be expecting dividends at the end of the financial year, at the end of the financial year. A convertible debenture, it is a debenture that can be converted into another interest in the company registerable debenture. So these ones basically simply mean just from the word registerable or basically registerable debenture. Uh, they are normally registered in the name of the holder. So they just basically contain all the details to do with the holder of the debenture, the number of debentures that have been acquired. So that is what we mean by a registerable debenture. It is simply registered in the name of the, the holder. It is simply registered in the name of the holder. So it can be basically be described as being a registerable debenture, as being a registerable uh, debenture. So those are the types of debentures that we can have. Those are the types of debentures that we can have. So we have this, we have debentures and we have shares. What are some of the differences between the two? Debentures versus shares. What are some of the differences between the two? Debentures versus shares. Debentures versus shares. Debentures versus shares. Debentures versus shares. I think I've mentioned some of them. I've already mentioned some of them. And I think most of you can actually easily even uh, tell me what are some of the differences between debentures and shares. Uh, you can easily tell me, <clears throat> can easily tell me uh, what are the differences between uh, debentures and shares. So I can see, I can see here, Brian Oda. Brian Oda, how are you? Is Brian there? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. 
You are good. Uh, uh, what do you think yeah. are some of the differences between debentures and shares? <clears throat> for the for the debentures, you earn interest. For the shares, you earn uh, you are being paid the dividends. Yes, that is very brilliant. That is very brilliant. So for the debentures, if you are hold of debentures in a company, you will earn interest. If you are hold of shares in a company, you are shareholder, you will earn dividends. You will earn dividends. So that is basically very brilliant. So I have here Carolyn B. Watt. Carolyn B. Watt, are you there? Uh, yes. Yes, Carolyn, how are you? I'm good. Yes, what do you think uh, are some of the differences between uh, debentures and shares? Um, the, um, for shares, the um, holder of the shares is a member of the company. Uh -huh. But for debenture, the holder of a debenture is a lender to the company. Is a lender to the, that is very brilliant. That is very brilliant. Oh, the holder of the ventures is actually a lender to the company, or you can say is a creditor to the company. But for the one who has basically acquired shares, is actually a member of the company. Is actually a member of the company or a shareholder of the company. Is a part owner of the company. You can simply say the holder of shares is actually the owner of the company. And they are owning your company. But the one who has basically acquired the benches, he am a corporation your company pesa, and therefore is actually a creditor of the company. Is actually a creditor of the company. So there's a point I've seen someone has written here. Let me see if I can be able to see it. So it has been written by Bob. So Bob says uh, held by the venture holder, and shares are held by shareholders. Uh -huh. The ventures are units of debts. Shares are units of capital. Uh -huh. So that is another good uh, uh, difference you can be able to uh, to mention. So something else you can be able to mention also as a difference between the ventures and shares is that uh, you know what happens with the ventures. That particular obligation of interest, it is mandatory to pay whether the company makes profits or not. Lazima ulipe interest. Bank itaki kujua kwamba unateseka una profits ama una nini. Bank itakukujie kwambie nataka interest. So they don't want to care whether you are making profits as a company or not. So the obligation in terms of interest for the case of the ventures, it is mandatory to pay whether the company is making profits or not. But what I, what I wish saying about shares, dividends can only be paid if the company has made profits. Dividends can only be paid if the company has actually been able to make uh, profits. If there's a loss, then it simply means that it is not actually a must. It's not actually a must to be able to uh, pay the dividends. So for the case of debentures, that interest, whether I make profit or not, at the end of the period, he doesn't want to care. But for the shareholders, dividends basically they'll be able to check as the company made profits. If there are no profits, then it simply means that dividends won't actually be, be paid. So the obligation in terms of the benches for the interest, it is mandatory to pay whether the company has made profits or not. But for the case of shares, it simply means that the dividends can only be paid if the company has been able to make has actually been able to make uh, profits. Also, another difference, the venture holders uh, during liquidation, when the life of the company is to come to an end, uh, they are normally given priority over shareholders. So how at Tetewa Kwanza, because Ababu are creditors or company, remember we are saying creditors basically must be paid first during liquidation. So they have to be paid first, then in case there are actually any residues, now they'll go to the shareholders. So the venture holders, so for the debentures, the debenture holders, uh, they'll be given priority on during liquidation of the company, or basically they'll be paid first, or they basically they'll be prioritized in terms of being paid first before even having to pay the shareholders. So task is ikifungwa sai to nasema kwamba our suppliers will supply you to condo atalipo kwanza as a priority before they even best holders of task is. So that is what we mean by that. Basically, those who basically provided for the capital in terms of debentures or lending money, they will be paid first on liquidation uh, before uh, they pay the shareholders of, of the company, before they pay the shareholders of, of the company. Uh, there is another one. So there is another one uh, that I've seen that, that I've just, has just been written there. Uh, 
uh, that uh, debentures can actually be issued at a discount, but uh, generally uh, the issue of shares at a discount is prohibited. So it is not actually really recommended to give out shares or issue shares at a discount. Probably if you issue shares at a discount, uh, then basically it simply means that you must actually uh, be able to provide for how you'll be able to cover for the that particular discount because you won't actually be realizing the true value of the share capital of the company. So issue of shares at a discount is generally prohibited. It's not actually allowed, although sometimes shares can be issued at a discount. But for the case of debentures, there is no harm. Basically, you can issue the debentures at a discount. You can issue the debentures at a discount. So those are some of the differences uh, between debentures and shares. Those are some of the differences between debentures and shares. We can look at similarities. So how similar are they? Similarities, how similar are they? How similar are they? So what are the similarities of uh, uh, these particular two instruments? So shares and debentures, shares and debentures. So I can see, I can see uh, here, I can see here, Irene. I can see here, Irene Mukabana. Irene Mukabana. Irene, are you there? Yes. Irene, Irene is there, but it seems like her network is not quite okay. Irene, can you be able to hear me clearly? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, fine. What do you think are some of the similarities between debentures and shares? Mm, I think both of them can be redeemed. Both of them can be redeemed. Yeah, that is very brilliant. So Irene is saying that both shares and debentures can be redeemed. So remember when we were looking at shares, we saw that we can have redeemable preference shares. Here we, we've also said there's a type of debenture known as there's a type of debenture uh, known as uh, a redeemable debenture. So both of them can actually be, be redeemed. Both of them can actually be redeemed. So that is actually also uh, very uh, brilliant. So I can see here we have um, Julius. Julius, my friend. Julius Mwenda. Julius Mwenda. Julius, how are you? Julius. Yes, Malim. Yes, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, what do you think are some of the similarities between uh, shares and debentures? Similarities between shares and debentures. Can you try or give us one? Are you able to give us one? The similarities. Or, uh, similarities, yes. Or we ask another friend of ours to give us? Uh, I think the similarity is that they all attract interest. They all attract interest. So uh, uh, Julius Mwenda is saying that both of them actually attract interest. Uh -huh. That is a good trial. That is a good trial. Uh, that is a good trial. So another similarity maybe you can actually also be able to mention is that both of them can be issued via a prospectors. Both of them can be issued via a prospectors. So both of them can actually be issued through a prospectors. So that is another similarity you can actually be able to mention. And one that is actually quite obvious, you can be able to say uh, both of them are a means of raising capital for the company. Both of them are a means of raising capital for the company. So you've said number one is that both of them can be redeemed. Number two, you're saying both of them can be issued via a prospectors or through our prospectors. Also, we are saying that in this case, both of them are means of raising capital for the company. So those are some of the similarities between uh, debentures and shares, the similarities between debentures and shares. Alternatively, also you can add another one and say, uh, both of them can be issued at par value or face value. Both of them can be issued at par value or face value. So they'll have a par value or a face value for each and every instrument in that case. So both of them can be issued at par or face value. Both of them can be issued at par or face value. Both of them can be issued at par or 
phase value can be issued at par or phase value or phase value. So those are the similarities uh, between the benches and shares. Those are the similarities between the benches and shares. So I want us to look at uh, something different uh, about debt capital, basically these things we are calling uh, uh, debentures. So I want us to look at charges. So uh, what do you mean by charges? These are simply the assets that have been used as a security, that have been charged. So they are basically been used as a security, or basically they have been charged such that in case the company defaults on payment, let's say, for example, to the debenture holders. So we were saying the debenture holders are acquiring debentures as they lend money to the company. So sometimes they could charge the assets of the company and they can be able to charge the assets of the company in two ways. So we can have a floating charge or a fixed charge. So we can have a floating charge or a fixed charge. So what do you mean by a, a fixed charge? So a fixed charge is normally a charge on a specific asset of the company. It is really specific that this particular debenture holder has chosen a specific asset of the company uh, that he wants to charge or use as a form of uh, security. So what do you mean by a fixed charge? It is a charge on a specific asset of the company. It is a charge on a specific asset of the company. So what you have also to note about a fixed charge is that the company cannot just deal with the asset in whatever way it wants with the asset without having to consult, let's say, for example, the debenture holders under that particular fixed charge. For example, if the company is to sell off the asset, if it is a motor vehicle, they are to sell it off. Uh, they have to consult the debenture holders whether they can be able to sell it off or not because it is actually very specific. It is on that particular spe specific asset because that is the only resort that these debenture holders have in case the company actually defaults. So what we mean by a fixed charge, it is normally a charge on a specific asset of of the company. It is on a charge on a very specific asset of, of the company. So uh, we can have them categorized into two. So we can have legal fixed charges and we can have equitable fixed charges. So uh, this one basically just relates, it relates to what we learned about a legal mortgage and an equitable mortgage. What do you mean by a legal fixed charge? In this case, this particular kind of uh, asset that has been charged will be transferred, will be transferred to the lender or basically the debenture holder's name until when this particular company is able to pay off its obligation in terms of the principal amount and interest. Uh, that's when basically now the asset will revert back or basically the ownership will go back to the company. So that's what we mean by a legal fixed charge. So the lender or the debenture holder basically takes over the asset. The asset is actually even transferred into his or her name. So it takes over all the rights under the assets until when the, co the company is actually able to pay off that particular principal amount and interest. That's when basically the ownership reverts back to uh, this particular uh, company. Equitable fixed charge. So in this case, the asset will basically still be in the premises or basically in the hands of the company, unless maybe the company defaults. That's when now this particular debenture holder or lender can be able to take up the step to recover the asset from the company. So the asset basically is still actually in the ownership of the company, unless maybe the company defaults, that's when now this particular lender or basically the venture holder can take over the asset due to the default in the payment of the interest or the principal amount. So what are we, have we said a fixed charge? It is a charge on a specific asset of the company, but the company cannot deal with the asset in whatever way it wants in the normal course of business, unless maybe they consult the debenture holders. So always yamuka to amuke or amue on a your asset. Come on, in motor vehicle, come out with the debenture holders or the persons who have charged the assets or used it as a security to lend money to the company. They have to always consult them. Uh, then we can have two of them. So we can have a legal or we can have an equitable fixed charge. Uh, then we have a floating charge. What do you mean by a floating charge? This one is now is not actually really specific. These are basically we, how we define it. We say that a floating charge is a charge 
that hovers over an asset until there's actually an occurrence of an event that causes the charge to settle. That causes the charge to settle. We are saying it just hovers. It is not really specific. In a chungulia to in a chungulia, not specific at that particular point. Until that particular point, until there is an occurrence of an event. It will cause, because in this case, for example, you had lend money to the company. So you are, so you are just checking. You're just checking. Is this company able to pay? If you see any signs of not actually being able to pay, now what you do, you go to the company now and tell them, I want now this asset. When you do that, that is now the event. That is now the event that is causing this particular charge now to settle. When you basically do that, basically you are going specifically for the asset. So now it will basically change. It will change. It will crystallize and actually become a fixed charge. So how do we define a floating charge? I've tried to explain it to the best way I can actually be able to explain it. It is a charge that hoovers, hoovers, hoovers over an asset until there is an occurrence of an event that causes the charge to settle. When it settles, it will no longer be a floating charge. It would have become very specific. It would have become now a fixed charge. So this particular aspect of settling, it is known as crystallization of a floating charge. Crystallization of a floating charge. Crystallization of a floating charge. So that's what we mean by a floating charge and a fixed charge, a floating charge and a fixed charge. So I think uh, for today, I'll end there. So I don't want to confuse you further with this particular floating charge and fixed charge. So maybe you can just basically uh, go up to that particular point, go up to that particular point so that we'll be able to expound on it next time. We learn more about our floating charge. What are the advantages of having a floating charge? What are the disadvantages of having a fixed charge? So someone is asking there, um, what is an example of a, a floating charge? What is an example of, of a, floating, a floating charge? So maybe we'll be able to expound uh, more on it uh, next time and actually give the examples of a floating, a floating charge. But just as I've told you, what we mean by this uh, charge actually being termed as a floating charge in this case, it simply means that the charge is not actually really specific on any asset. Uh, basically, what is what is happening in this case, uh, the lender in this case, or basically the debenture is just trying to monitor whether you have the capability of actually being able to pay his amount. If you are not actually able to pay, now we say this particular charge is no longer actually a floating charge. It will become a, a fixed charge. So what we'll discover that if, under a floating charge, you can do anything with the, that particular asset you can either sell it even without the knowledge of the lender you can get another one so you can just do deal with the asset in the normal course of business without having to uh, basically uh, maybe inform the lender or basically the debenture holder so for floating charges the company is at liberty to deal with the asset in whatever way in the normal course of business in the normal course of business so there is no basically uh, a lot of checking or basically ensuring that the asset is actually intact by the debenture holder. It is not like a fixed charge, whereby in this case you are saying it is very specific. They already know that that particular asset has been charged by the debenture holder. And therefore, before even they do anything, the asset in the normal course of business, they have to basically inform uh, those who have charged the assets. But for floating charge, it basically just hoovers over an asset until maybe there's actually an occurrence of an event.